Hi everyone, welcome back to Learn with Mednuggets. So today I'm going to teach you about sexual disorders, which is a commonly tested topic in your board exams. So over here we have nine scenarios and I'm going to explain nine high yield sexual disorders to you all through questions because I feel like that's a better way to approach this topic because it's a bit of a boring topic. So let's begin. All right, first scenario, newborn baby 46XX with ambiguous genitalia, low sodium and high potassium. So the diagnosis here is congenital adrenal hyperplasia, 21 hydroxylase deficiency. 21 hydroxylase is an enzyme that our body uses to produce aldosterone and cortisol from cholesterol, right? So there are three hormones that are produced in our adrenal glands, that is aldosterone, cortisol, and testosterone. All these three hormones are produced from cholesterol, right? So cholesterol, as you can see in this diagram, is converted to pregnolone. Pregnolone gets converted to aldosterone with the help of the enzyme 21-hydroxylase. And it gets converted to cortisol along this pathway with the help of the enzyme 21 hydroxylase. So 21 hydroxylase is required for the conversion of pregnolone to aldosterone and cortisol. But look at testosterone over here. Testosterone um, gets converted to, sorry, cholesterol gets converted to testosterone with the help of the enzyme 17 hydroxylase. It doesn't need 21 hydroxylase. Therefore, this pathway will not get affected. It's these two pathways that will get affected. And as a result of that, our body will, be, will not be able to produce aldosterone or cortisol. Now that brings us to what is the function of aldosterone and what is the job of cortisol, right? Aldosterone is a hormone that absorbs sodium and excretes potassium, right? So, this, so if this hormone is not working, our body will not be able to retain sodium or excrete potassium, right? As a result of that, the sodium concentration in the blood will go down and the potassium concentration in the blood will go up. Okay, is that clear to you all? Right. Cortisol is also known as our body's stress hormone. When our body is stressed, when we are under a lot of stress, our body produces cortisol and increases our blood pressure and blood glucose levels to cope with that stress. So if your body can't produce cortisol, your body won't be able to regulate the blood pressure and glucose levels. As a result of that, this kind of a person will have low blood pressure, hypotension, and low blood glucose levels, hypoglycemia. Right? So what happens when these two pathways don't work? Cholesterol will, um, I mean, this pathway over here will get activated, will get overactivated, right? All the cholesterol will be shunted along this pathway to produce more testosterone because uh, the cholesterol can't go um, in these two pathways. It will be shunted um, to produce testosterone, right? It will kind of, this, uh, this pathway will get overactivated and your body will start to produce more and more testosterone, right? So, uh, in this question, you can see 46XX means this kind of a patient is genotypically female, right? But has ambiguous genitalia. What is ambiguous genitalia? That means genitalia that doesn't clearly look like a male or a female, right? You can't, you can't um, tell if the baby is a male or a female by looking at their genitalia. That is what you mean by ambiguous genitalia, right? So, if a girl, if a girl, if a patient who is uh, genotypically a female is producing lots and lots of testosterone, this girl is obviously not going to look like a girl. She's going to have ambiguous genitalia, right? So um, a classic case of congenital adrenal hyperplasia with 21-hydroxylase deficiency caused by 21-hydroxylase deficiency is always going to be a, a genotypic female presenting with ambiguous genitalia and low sodium and high potassium, right? So, um, the so the first scenario is congenital adrenal hyperplasia, right? 
Now let's move on to the second scenario. Right? 21-year-old female who had never menstruated, has a blind vaginal pouch, normal breast development, Tanner stage 1 axillary and pubic hair, and ultrasound shows testes. Right? So what's the diagnosis here? It's androgen insensitivity syndrome. Right? So when you look at a question stem, if the stem says that, okay, this patient is having testes, that means the patient is genotypically male. If the stem says this patient is the ultrasound, this patient is having ovaries or the ultrasound shows ovaries, that means the patient is genotypically female. So over here in this question, this 21-year-old female, right, is having testes. That means even though this person looks like a female from the exterior, from outside, this patient is genotypically a male, actually a male. Right? So, that's the first point, right? In this question, this patient is genotypically male. Right? Second point is this patient so, patients with androgen insensitivity syndrome, they have normally functioning testes, right? The functioning testes, right? So, testes has two kinds of cells. A normal functioning testes has two kinds of cells. That is, Sertoli cells and Leydig cells. Right, Sertoli cells secrete mullerian inhibitory factor. What is mullerian inhibitory factor? It's a factor that inhibits the mullerian duct. Right, mullerian duct is something that gives rise to structures like um, so. Our mullerian duct it gives rise to struct uh, structures like the uterus, fallopian tubes, and the upper two-thirds of the vagina, right? So what Mullerian inhibitory factor does is it goes and inhibits the Mullerian duct, which gives rise to the uterus, fallopian tubes, and the upper two-thirds of the vagina. That's the function of the Mullerian inhibitory factor. That is why males don't have a uterus, fallopian, tube, uh, fallopian tubes, or a vagina, right? Then Leydig cells, on the other hand, secrete testosterone, right? What is testosterone, right? So, testosterone, how does it work? When testosterone goes and binds to the testosterone receptors, it is able to uh, do its job, right? Testosterone has to bind to the testosterone receptor in order to do its job. So, what is the function of testosterone? Testosterone leads to the development of the it leads to the development of the Wolfian duct. The Wolfian duct is also known as the mesonephric duct. Right? So it's it leads to the development of the Wolfian duct structures. What are the structures derived from the Wolfian duct? Wolfian duct uh, leads to the development of internal male genital structures, such as the seminal vesicles, vas deferens, and the epididymis. Right? So that's the first function of testosterone. Testosterone, when it binds to the receptor, it leads to the development of the Wolfian duct structures, which um, are the internal male genital structures like the seminal vesicles, vas deferens, and epididymis. Right? And the second function of testosterone is that it gets converted to DHT dihydrotestosterone with the help of the enzyme 5 alpha reductase right dht is what leads to the development of external genital structures right so remember 
uh, testosterone leads testosterone leads to the development of Wolfian duct structures, which are the internal male genital structures like your seminal vesicles, vas deferens, and epididymis, right? Whereas DHT, not testosterone, it's a derivative of testosterone, DHT, that leads to the development of external genital structures like the penis, scrotum, and the prostate. Right? And also, DHT uh, will lead to, uh, will produce male features like male pattern, boldness, right? And axillary and pubic hair, acne, and all that stuff, right? Things that make you look like a male from the outside, right? So, once again, I'm going to repeat. Testosterone is what makes it is what makes you a male from the inside, right? It uh, it is responsible for the activation of the Wolfian duct structures like um, your seminal vesicles, vas deferens, epididymis, everything that makes you look like a male from the inside. Whereas DHT, which is produced with um, which is produced from testosterone, DHT makes you look like a male from the outside. Right, it gives rise to the external genital structures like the penis, scrotum, and prostate, and it makes you look like a man with the beard, uh, the axillary hair, male pattern, baldness, and all that stuff. Right. So what happens in um, androgen insensitivity syndrome is that there's a problem with the androgen receptor. There's a problem with this testosterone receptor. As a result of that testosterone won't be able to bind to the receptor and do its job, right? What is the job of testosterone? It won't be able to produce the, any of these Wolfian duct structures or external genitalia or the male features, right? So this patient is not going to have internal genital structures, external genital structures or any of the features that is going to make him look like a male, right? So this male is going to look like a female in other words, right? And also, in this question, you can see the patient has normal breast development, right? Why is the patient having normal breast development? Because this excess testosterone that is floating around in the blood is going to get converted to estrogen with the help of the aromatase enzyme. There's an enzyme called aromatase, right, which converts testosterone to estrogen. As a result of that, this patient is going to have normal breast development because estrogen is what produces breasts in females, right? So the diagnosis here is androgen insensitivity syndrome. Questions regarding androgen insensitivity syndrome is always going to talk about a beautiful woman with like well-formed breasts, with less pubic and axillary hair, right? But she is going to have testis. Ultrasound scan is going to show testis, right? So it's going to be a beautiful woman with testis, right? Uh, all right. So now let's move on to uh, the next scenario. 21-year-old female who had never menstruated, has a blind vaginal pouch, normal breast development, thanner stage 4 axillary and pubic hair, and her ultrasound shows ov ovaries. What's the diagnosis? The diagnosis here is MRKH syndrome, right? It's a congenital anomaly um, of the Mullerian duct, right? So let's... Um, have a look at the question, right? So this in this question, they have clearly mentioned that the ultrasound shows ovaries, right? Remember I told you before, if the ultrasound shows ovaries, this patient is going to be genotypically female. If the ultrasound shows testis, uh, the patient is going to be genotypically male. So over here, the patient is genotypically female, right? So this is a female who doesn't have a uterus um, or fallopian tubes or um, a vagina, a fully formed vagina, right? A female without female internal organs. 
if a question is talking about a genotypic female without female internal organs, that is MRHK syndrome. Period. So, over here in this question, you can see that this patient is having Tanner stage 4 um, axillary and pubic hair. That means her testosterone is working fine. Right? And she's having normal breasts. That means her estrogen is also working fine. But she's having a blind vaginal pouch. Blind vaginal pouch means only the lower one-third of her vagina is present. Right? The upper two-thirds of her vagina, cervix, uterus, fallopian tubes, all of the, those structures are absent. All the structures that are derived from the Mullerian duct are absent. Ovaries are obviously uh, there because they are not a uh, because they are not a Mullerian structure. Ovaries are not derived from the Mullerian duct, right? So ovaries are present. So this female is having everything but the Mullerian duct structures, right? So M so the diagnosis is MRHK syndrome because it causes it's a congenital anomaly that causes Mullerian agenesis. As a result of that, all the Mullerian duct structures will be uh, will not be formed properly or it will be absent. Right? That brings us to the end of uh, the third scenario. And now let's move on to the fourth scenario. Right? 12-year-old female with fused labia, abnormal clitoris, is starting to look like a male at around puberty. Ultrasound shows testes. Okay, so in this question, they are talking about a female with fused labia, abnormal clitoris, with some ambiguous genital structures, right? Who is starting to look more like a female, who is starting to look more like a male. So a female kind of turning into a male at around puberty, right? An ultrasound shows testes. So if the ultrasound is showing testes, that means this patient is genotypically male, right? Genotypically male, right? And it uh, uh, looks like a female, genotypically male, but is starting to look more like a male at around puberty, right? So the diagnosis here is 5-alpha reductase deficiency. Can you tell me what happens at puberty? At puberty, there's a, there's a surge of testosterone, right? There's a sudden increase in the amount of testosterone in puberty, right? What is 5-alpha reductase? 5-alpha reductase is the enzyme that converts testosterone to DHT, dihydrotestosterone. It's DHT that leads to the development of external genital structures like your penis, scrotum, and your prostate, right? So if there's a deficiency in 5-alpha reductase, then DHT will not be formed. As a result of that, this patient is not going to have external genital structures like the penis, scrotum, and all that, right? The patient will have a fused labia and abnormal clitoris. When we are born, be it males or females, we are all born as females, right? We are all going to have um, a labia, a clitoris, and all those structures, right? It's with its testosterone that causes differentiation of these female structures into male structures. Your labia becomes the scrotum and your clitoris becomes the penis, right? So all males, they are born as females, and it's with the action of DHT right, testosterone, that uh, your labia differentiates into the scrotum and your clitoris differentiates into the penis, right? So if there's no DHT, these structures are going to remain as it is, right? Labia is not going to differentiate into scrotum and, clitoris is not, and the clitoris is not going to differentiate into the penis, right? So these males are going to look like females because they don't have DHT, because they don't have the enzyme 5-alpha reductase which converts testosterone to DHT. But during puberty, there's a surge in testosterone, right? There's a big supply, there's a huge supply of testosterone, right? As a result of that, it's somehow or other going to force this conversion into DHT. Right? When there's a lot of testosterone, it's somehow or other trying to get converted into 
DHT in our body. And this happens during puberty. Because of that, during puberty, this female, who is a genotypic male, is going to start to look like a male because of that supply of testosterone. Right? That is what happens in 5-alpha reductase deficiency. I hope you all understood. If you have any questions, please drop it down in the comments section below. I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right. So now let's move on to the fifth scenario. Right? Female 46XX, genotypically female, right, with acne and facial hair starting to look like a male, worsening of acne, increase in facial hair, deepening of voice, so starting to look like a male during pregnancy. Right. So the diagnosis is aromatase deficiency. Right. Like I mentioned before, aromatase is the enzyme that converts testosterone to estrogen. So what happens uh, in a patient with aromatase deficiency? The patient won't be able to produce enough estrogen, right? As a result of that, there will be more testosterone in the body. So this woman is going to have, um, is going to look like a male, right? She's going to have a lot of facial hair, acne, right? And um, a deeper voice, right? What happens in pregnancy is that when you're pregnant, your placenta starts to produce lots and lots of androgens, tons and tons of androgens, right? And these androgens are going to get into the maternal circulation, right? Now we have tons and tons of androgens in the mother's blood, and there's no aromatase. As a result of that, this mother is going to get severe acne, more and more facial hair, and her voice is going to deepen. All the effects of testosterone is going to get multiplied, right? She already had these features to begin with, but during pregnancy, since the placenta is producing tons and tons of androgens, tons and tons of testosterone, her acne is going to um, increase, her facial hair is going to increase, and her voice is going to get deepened, right? So the diagnosis is aromatase deficiency. Okay, now let's move on to the sixth scenario. 21-year-old female with congenital lymphedema of the neck, lower extremity claudication, and radiofemoral delay. What's the diagnosis? This is Turner syndrome, right? So turn, in Turner syndrome, babies are going to present with um, features like shield chest, right? streak ovaries, horseshoe kidneys, but but questions are not going to mention these buzzwords. We know that patients with Turner syndrome can have cystic hygromas in their neck. But the question is not going to give this buzzword cystic hygroma. Instead, the question can tell, oh, this patient is having congenital lymphedema of the neck. So you should know that congenital lymphedema of the neck is a cystic hygroma, right? And this patient is also having lower extremity claudication and radiofemoral delay, both of which can be seen in coarctation of aorta, which is um, a condition that is associated with Turner syndrome. So um, the diagnosis here is Turner syndrome, right? There's another very important point I want to stress on when it comes to Turner syndrome, that is patients with Turner syndrome have streak ovaries, right? their ovaries are short, right? So because of that, these ovaries won't be able to produce estrogen. When the estrogen concentration in our body is low, it will, uh, through negative feedback, it will signal the hypothalamus and the pituitary to make more and more um, FSH and LH in order to increase the estrogen concentration in the blood, right? Which we call hyper gonadotropic hypogonadism, right? The streak ovaries won't be able to produce estrogen, therefore it's hypogonadism. As a result of that, through negative feedback, it will tell, it will try to signal the hypothalamus and the pituitary to produce more um, FSH and LH, right? More, more gonadotropic hormones, more GnRH, right? So it will be hypergonadotropic hypogonadism, right? Okay, question number seven. 21-year-old female who had never menstruated 
Tana stage 1 axillary and pubic hair and problems with smell. She's having problems with smell as well. So this is a very easy, straightforward question. If you know, you know. If you don't know, you don't know. So this is called Kalman syndrome, right? So Kalman syndrome is a genetic condition that affects the brain, causing a deficiency of GnRH neurons and olfactory receptor neurons, right? So as a result of that, the GnRH neurons won't be able to produce FSH and LH in females, right? It will affect the HPO axis and there will be a delay or absence of puberty, right? And uh, since it's affecting the olfactory receptor neurons, the patient won't, will have problems with smell, right? So Kalman syndrome is a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism because it's affecting the HPO axis, right? As a result of that, there'll be low GnRH and low FSH and LH, right? So that is uh, Kalman syndrome. Eighth question. 17-year-old female swimmer on a strict diet for a competition presents with amenorrhea, right? What's the diagnosis? This is athletic amenorrhea, right? Uh, this happens to us as well. I mean, you must have noticed that close to exams or when you're following a strict diet or when you're like working out too much in the gym and stuff, right? Your periods, they start to become irregular. Why is that? Because too much stress on your body can inhibit the HPO axis, right? It can inhibit the HPO axis and cause a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, right? This is also called the female athlete triad, amenorrhea, reduced caloric intake, and osteoporosis, right? So why osteoporosis? We know that estrogen protects our bones, right? So if there's no estrogen, it will start to uh, break down our bones and cause osteo osteoporosis, right? So that is uh, athletic amenorrhea. Then the last question, 27-year-old man with a low libido Poorly developed axillary hair, he's very tall, has gynecomastia, a small penis, and a family history of breast cancer. What's the diagnosis? This is a Klinefelter syndrome, right? It's a genetic condition that affects boys, uh, and the genotype is 47XXY, where these boys are having an extra X chromosome, right? As a result of that, their testis is not functioning properly, right? So they'll have low testosterone. Gynecomastia is a characteristic feature um, in these patients, and questions love to go after this point, right? It's always the questions are always going to describe a man with breasts, right? And Klinefelter syndrome and patients with Klinefelter syndrome also have a small penis and big testes, right? So, since they have low testosterone, right, the, their body will try to produce more GnRH through negative feedback to try and increase the level of testosterone in the body, which we call hypergonadotropic hypogonadism, right? So, these patients are generally going to be very tall. Right, they're going to have gynecomastia. And uh, delayed puberty as well because of the low testosterone. And these patients also have learning disabilities. Right? And another very important point you need to remember is that these patients have, a, have an increased risk of breast cancer, right? 
So the question will uh, describe a family history of breast cancer or something like that, right? Most of these cases, they go unnoticed until fertility problems arise when they're trying to have children. And you can treat these fertility problems with the help of art, which is um, assistive reproductive technology. Uh, art can be used to treat infertility in these patients. And that brings us to the end of our video. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.